All right, welcome everybody to uh, On the Ball, the new video interview series for the Vanderbilt Sports and Society Initiative. Uh, really excited to have Greg Bishop with us today, uh, senior writer at Sports Illustrated, uh, fantastic writer, great guy. Um, and Greg, I know you just got back from uh, Qatar in the World Cup, um, and I'm interested in in talking to you about uh, just your experience there. I think it's something that those of us who weren't fortunate enough to be able to go just are curious about what's it really like there. Um, but then also wanted to talk about just the tragic news of uh, Grant Wall um, passing away while covering uh, the World Cup. Uh, such an important figure as a sports writer and clear from all of the uh, tributes that have been written to him over the last several days, just what an amazing person he was um, beyond being an amazing uh, writer. So thank you for joining us on both of those counts. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to read what you posted on Facebook, if that's all right with you, um, in response to uh, Grant uh, passing away, because I think that this paragraph sort of contains all the types of themes that I wanted to ask you about. Um, but you said, Grant Wall was a giant, tenacious, wide ranging, kind. He came from a generation of SI writers who made young nerds like me want to be SI writers but he wasn't the big timing type. He always helped, always wrote, always pursued. I last saw, saw him in Doha about 10 days ago. We joked about the constant unease and his detainment. I can only pray that the theories about how he died aren't true, but know this, Grant passed doing what he did as well as anyone I've worked with. He went to Qatar, he felt the danger we all did. He wrote exactly how everyone else felt despite great personal risk and he told the truth. He stood up for those who didn't have a voice there and he did it because that was him at his core, a feeling so central to his being that people who don't do this work would never understand it. I can only hope this ethos is carried out in the investigation of his death and the circumstances that surround it. Grant deserves that. Um, you know, which I thought was a uh, beautiful and really insightful uh, a tribute to a, a friend. And so I wanted to kind of walk through that. When you talk about him being a a giant, I know, uh, literally and figuratively, right? Um, for those of us who never got to meet him, you know, like, why do you describe him that way? You know, to me, there, there's a, a lot of things in play there. You know, you can see on my office wall, those are my Super Bowl covers. I've done the last eight. I've also got Dak Prescott up there. But before I wrote for Sports Illustrated, I was a nerdy kid who grew up in Tacoma, Washington, reading the New York Times before school every day. And I got SI as a subscription from my dad when I was eight. And I said, I, I want to do that. But it, it never really feels reachable until you meet somebody like Grant. You know, he, he worked at SI right out of Princeton. He covered multiple beats. He did them all well. I would say um, nobody really seemed to dislike him. I never heard somebody really say a bad word about the guy. And you run into all sorts of types at SI. When I first got there it was 2014. You know, there were writers on that staff. There are writers on our staff that just don't engage with the uh, with the peons like myself. You know, there are editors that are more into the legacy of it, and ones that you know I've had really awesome relationships with. But Grant kind of showed me like if you really care about something, that there's always a way to do it. And, you know, I've seen so much since his death about how he changed soccer in America. And that to me is not overstated and very cool because this is a guy who it's what I meant in the post. Like, I feel like I have to explain myself to people who don't know what I do in a way that's impossible to make them understand. It's it's deeper than a job. It's more like a craft. It feels like it hooks into your soul. And as our industry has fallen apart, I've thought about doing other things, but I just don't know how I would fulfill myself in that case. And, you know, Grant pursued truth. Grant wanted to tell stories. He cut nobody any breaks and he did it, I think. And again, I, I don't know, only he would know, but I think he did it because it was intrinsic. It was inside of him, you know, and it, it was a, a model for somebody like me who, is you know a poor man's grant wall to look at him and how he approached his job and why it it fucking mattered to him and it's all i keep thinking about it's like maybe maybe i'll keep writing because there's it's just unexplainable like how how you just get hooked into these things and 
to watch him do it as recently as a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. I mean, yeah, just it sort of doesn't feel real if if you'll pardon my rambling. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, I had a bit of a background around sports writers. I mean, I, I grew up around them. My dad was a, a journalist at the Washington Post. He still is, but he's basically retired. But uh, I knew a lot of the, his benefits. Yeah. 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 Friends in at the Post and um, was an SID at Vandy. So a lot, of, a lot of press boxes over the course of my life. And you run across sports writers, um, some of whom are kind of crusty and, and cynical, even about the sports that they cover, you know, and you can sense that they can't wait for the game to be over. Um, and it doesn't sound like that happened with Granny's covering soccer, um, you know, and covering every aspect, uh, including the corruption and um, surrounding the game, but also loved the game and was, you know, like you say, really changed the way people in this country even think about the sport, you know? So how, how did he maintain that sort of journalistic integrity while also really just loving what he was doing. Yeah. He was one of the first people that really showed me you can like something and be objective about it. Cause you see, I mean, you're, you're in the South and you've, you've been in the college football space. You know, you go to press boxes a lot of those, the, a lot of the writers seem like they're really tethered to the team's fortunes, but it's in a way that sort of twists what they're writing about away from what's true. Right. I mean, Grant loved soccer. He loved soccer as much as anyone loves anything. I wish there was something in my life that I love other than my children that he loved as much as he loved that sport. And yet he didn't cut anyone any breaks. He was hard on the MLS when he needed to be. He broke news stories in relation to FIFA and the corruption there. But he like put Mia Hamm and that team on the map with a cover story a million years ago. He, uh, you know, it was just everything. And you saw it in Qatar and the way he covered it. You know, he covered how amazing the games were. He was great on strategy. His Substack subscription for me was one of the best $50 I ever spent because I was a newbie going out to cover this thing who doesn't know a ton about the sport. And it helped me like get a grip on things I was doing out there. I also think that in addition to, to the Guardian, Grant did as good a work as has been done on the migrant workers and their deaths. He wasn't scared to write what he saw. So why did it resonate? Why did it change? That's why. Because he was authentic. He was genuine. He cared about it in a way where he wasn't writing about soccer's problems from the vantage point of someone who thought the sport was boring or should be changed. He cared about it in the way where he wrote what he thought no matter what. And that might sound like a baseline thing for any journalist, but it's, it's not in my experience. You know, it's hard to write critically of people. It's really hard to write critically of people you deal with all the time. And yet you saw after he died, every person or group that I just mentioned had something nice to say about him. Now, I guarantee you they did not like every word that he wrote. But to me, that's the crux of what we do. That's, that is, that's journalism because it's got to be the, the first duty of a journalist has to be to their writer, I mean, to their reader, the person that's taking the time to consume things, that wants a full, truthful version of a story. And Grant straddled that balance as well as anybody I've ever seen, in that, like, he loved the sport. In some ways, he was a power broker within it, which I think is a foreign concept for most of us. And And he wrote really nice stories when warranted and really positive ones, and he wrote other stuff when it was there, too. And I just think if, if you couldn't, I think that's the reason the outpouring around him has been so big, because it just seems like, you, he, you know, Grant and I weren't like best friends, you know, but like every person who had interactions with the guy says the same thing. It couldn't be nicer. It couldn't be more helpful. And yet he kicked everybody's ass. I'm sorry, I'm swearing too much on here, but uh, <laughs> that's all right. It's always the, that guy, right, who's so good, he knows it and he can walk in there and write the best story and still help you with yours. And it's uh, it's weird. I'm talking to you. I'm getting chills a little bit because yeah. a guy like that shouldn't be gone at 49. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that about kicking your ass while he's being nice to you. Like uh, Jordan Ritter Khan, who lives here in Nashville, posted something yeah. almost exactly along those lines. You know that he was really helping him. He, uh, they were on the same story. You know, they went out to dinner and had a great time. And then he and then Jordan said he was delivered the biggest journalistic ass kicking of his life. <laughs> well, <laughs> Bye, Grant. Funny you said that. I don't mean to interrupt you, but you know, 
some of the best journalists I know are the nicest humans, which you wouldn't say in general about most journalists. I think of somebody like John Branch or Eli Saslow, your dad's old uh, desk neighbor at the Post. Um, I mean, those are you put those two with grants, three of the best journalists alive, and they're all incredibly nice and kind people. Maybe that's why I never made that level, you know, Andrew? But, uh, <laughs> that's right. yeah, there you go. I guess yeah. they just have a, a certain confidence that they don't have to be insecure and, you know, take that out on the people around it, maybe. But yeah, I think that probably plays into it. <clears throat> but even then, I'm curious why they were so helpful. I mean, Grant was like, when I saw him last, he said, do you need anything? Are you OK? Like, do you feel like they're tracking you? Like all the things we were dealing with. And he was doing that while podcasting every day, dropping interviews, dropping stories. I mean, it's clear he worked a lot and it was something that resonated a lot with me in the aftermath. But um, yeah, I just, I don't think you can find a better dude. Well, um, in that answer, you, you know, you said he asked you if you felt like you were being tracked. And so I wanted to get to some of that. You also, in your original statement, you said you, we joked about the constant unease and his detainment. So like, what did it feel like to be a journalist there in Qatar at the World Cup and just sort of that sense of uh, surveillance uh, that may, may have been on uh, journalists that were there? Well, if Big Brother's listening, uh, my name is Jeff Passan, uh, P-A-S-S-A-N. Uh, no, um, you know, I flip back and forth a lot because part of me thinks it's just the paranoia from what I read and, you know, the, the way I sort of expected it to go. And then part of me thinks like, no, there was really some weird stuff going on. I'll just give you a download of my experience, um, you know, inside of my apartment. And we were staying where the U.S. support staff was staying. Anyone who wasn't in the Kapensky, which is the big fancy hotel the players were at. And we had an embassy person with us, we were told. I never saw him, but like, you know, they, they clearly wanted somebody there to be there in the event that something happened. Uh, when I tried to FaceTime my kids, it didn't work in the apartment. I had to go down the block, turn off my Wi-Fi, and then I could FaceTime out. We were told uh, various accounts of whether this was, I'm not sure if this is true, but they told us that Facebook, uh, anything that's a video call isn't even illegal in, in Qatar. And um, then weird stuff just started happening, you know? Um, one time I was on my laptop, but I wasn't touching it and the cursor was moving. Another time I logged into Facebook and there were 10 accounts under my name instead of my two that I actually have. Uh, my phone's been acting funny ever since I went there. It's just uh, I had sources that made me leave my apartment complex to call. I had sources that made me leave the stadium to call. I had somebody that met me in the middle of the desert to do an interview for a story that will be out at the end of the week. And um it was like an hour and a half cab ride you know and like I don't know if any of this is really true or if it's like the New England Patriots in the NFL where other teams look at them and they're just seeing ghosts mostly and that's you know like a tactical advantage but I would be lying to you if I said it didn't enter into my mind and I don't know anything about what actually happened but when I when I saw the news on Grant and then another writer died and I don't know it it is at minimum one heck of a coincidence yeah um you know i wanted to get to that like uh I, I assume that there's some measure of would you admit like there's some islamophobia in the the, the rush to sort of assume that the, that he was murdered for what he wrote but on the other hand um based on the reaction to some of his stories which we've seen you know uh and just the, the sort of the tenor of, of the country or their leadership there. It doesn't seem entirely far-fetched to think that this, something may have happened. I'm not asking you to speculate, but yeah. for those of you who were there covering it, it, it sounds like you at least think this should be thoroughly investigated because there's a possibility that it, it was foul play. That's exactly where I'd land. You know, I saw him a few days before he started writing about being sick, just to preface my answer. And he looked fine. I mean, he was healthy. He was skinny. Um, you know, we all work a lot. I think that's sort of part of the job description and the part that scares me this week more than it did last. And uh, I just think like whatever can be done must be done. That's exactly where I'd land on it. You know, they need to, his family needs that phone. People need to go through it. We need to know everything we can about when he went to the doctor out there, what they gave him, you know, the, hopefully there's cameras in the facility. 
um, everything about the day of his life. I, I have talked to other writers out there who have been interviewed by the local police, and I assume that would happen. My understanding is the State Department's involved. I, I have to be really careful, and I think, you know, you feel the same way. Like, I, I have no personal inkling that anything nefarious happened to him. That's, some, that's something that the government, you know, did what we saw, like in the case of Jamal Khashoggi. But uh, I just know it felt weird out there. You woke up every day with a real feeling of unease. You know, there were times I had private taxi drivers who said that's state security behind us. Um, and part of me kind of laughs because like, who am I, right? It's some hack that writes for Sports Illustrated. And I, I kind of like, no way, you know, it's kind of what I thought in my head. But Grant Wall was a he was a giant and you know he wrote very critically of them as as or more critically than anybody else who was out there i'd argue more and it is a really really wild coincidence if he did all of that and we know what we know about the government there and we know what it's capable of and he happened to drop dead at a world cup game i mean it's it's hard to reconcile. Now, I'm not saying it happened. I just don't know. It just it's really, really weird. That's yeah. what I'd say. Um, you know, and some people are following this story like uh, minute by minute. Others, maybe this is one of the first interviews they've heard on it. But you, you talked to him shortly after he was detained, or at least you texted with him. Um, can you just share with us, like, why was he detained for uh, those who may not have that background? Yeah, Grant was detained because he wore a rainbow shirt uh, to the security at the stadium. Uh, subsequently, we've all found out from his brother that his brother is, you know, a part of that community and that he did it to support them, not to be, uh, you know, I've seen people describe it as a aggrandizing or, you know, to sort of like make himself the point of attention. But it turns out it wasn't that at all. He was doing it because he was being supportive of his brother. Yeah. And I think that when I texted with him, it was sort of a, you saw this a lot at stadiums. Like if you had a flag, a rainbow flag of any kind, people had masks on that were like that. I saw people carrying rainbow flags and I saw people wearing shirts like that. I mean, they, they made you take it off or turn it inside out. And that went for other symbols too. I'm forgetting any off the top of my head, but uh, I believe that um, Jewish symbols were also in the same way, you know, um, and they would cite things, the security guards, you know, who are from all over the place. 90% of Qatar is not Qatari. You know, they're from everywhere in the world. So, and there's sort of like a caste system within a caste system. So all my coffee shop people were Filipino. The baker I knew was Moroccan. Most of the cab drivers were from India or Pakistan. And security was generally Sudanese or people from Iman. Hmm. And you know, they would say essentially that they didn't want the person wearing these things, which were, uh, they contended deeply offensive uh, to, to be hurt. You know, that was sort of the sell. Like they were protecting the wearer's safety. And, um, you know, I saw, I was at that game that night. I did see Grant briefly. He seemed a little frazzled. Um, you know, I think he was thinking about um, ramifications, you know, and, he still wrote it, you know, so he didn't feel, I don't think like he was under any sort of threat, but yeah, it was, it was, it's just one more weird piece to a very strange puzzle. Yeah. And I want to get back to that, but, and then I guess his last article was about how the Qataris didn't seem to care or obviously didn't care about the migrant workers uh, who were dying all around them. Um, but in re referencing his detainment, you said, this is the last non-burner text I sent him the night he got detained. Um, so there, does that imply there were burner texts you sent him and what was the, uh, the burner phone situation? Like, why did you have one? What sort of, why were people, uh, journalists using, um, burner phones in addition to their regular phone? Yeah, I think most everyone I knew had one, you know, and the idea was that w one of the ways to get into the country that you had to have was this thing called a Haya card. And if you didn't have a Haya card, you couldn't get in. It was essentially like a visa. So it, it sort of said what you did. For fans who had tickets to matches, it was part of how you got inside the stadium. So, you know, a fan could only get a Hyatt card if they had a ticket for group play. And that's the only way they could come into Qatar until group play was over. And, you know, I think 
again, I have no knowledge that this actually happened, but I, I think most people who were on it thought of it like a tracking device, you know, like I see. it was on all the time. Uh, you had to show it at the stadiums in addition to your press credential. I mean, I, uh, mine's downstairs where I'd show you, but there's like 17 badges on there. You needed one to get in the fan festival and you needed tickets for matches and some of the stuff is normal, but it felt like an extra layer and when I went to Saudi Arabia for a story and came back, you know, my higher card was what got me in. And their insistence that there was a problem with my higher card is what got me near the strip search. Mm. And, uh, you know, it just it just felt like then you're downloading, you know, you got to use Uber out there. It, Uber was amazing. It was like eight bucks a ride. I took like a thousand of them, you know, and you, they have all these delivery apps. And, you know, I, I just think that most people sort of felt like if you were using your regular phone, you were putting the people you're talking to if, if your story was critical in harm's way. And so I am sure there were writers that didn't have a burner, but not nobody that I talked to. And I tried to just confine my official state business communications to, to the one I had. I got you. Now, your stories um, were a great sort of uh, color of, of the tournament, you know, whether at the sites or in Saudi Arabia or just around the country. Um, but did you also spend time in the press box where he, he passed away or similar uh, press boxes? I guess they called them media tribunes. Yeah. I, it's funny you said that because uh, people have been writing it wrong. There is no press box in these stadiums. They're just part of the stands and, you know, it's just row after row, but they have outlets and, you know, place for your computer. Okay. Do you happen to know which stadium he, he died at? I'm no, I, I, I should, but I don't. I'm forgetting off the top of my head. I went to six of the eight, so there's a very good chance that I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, if it was at Lucille, I spent quite a bit of time there, which is where the uh, World Cup final will be. And I, I would say I didn't find security at these places any different than most. You know, it felt like a world track or an Olympics, you know. Um, you show your badge to get and then you go through security to get through the perimeter. And then from there, you just show your media credential a thousand times. Um trying to think if I have any good Tribune stories. No, mine were pretty uneventful. Yeah. Pretty stock, like, desk situation. They have Ethernet cables so that um, if uh, the Wi-Fi is not working and it was often not working there, then you just plug in, you know, because all this infrastructure is new. It can't handle the amount of people there. Okay. And I do... Actually, now that I think about it, they, they, I went to the opener, which was in Alcor, the big tent-like stadium, and it was Ecuador against Qatar. And um, now that I think about it, they gave us all like these gift bags. I should go make sure that there's nothing in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, who knows what they put in there? I did bring it home too. Shoot. All right. Let us know what you find. Yeah. Um, and then also in his uh, a podcast interview he did shortly before he passed away, he mentioned that he was sick and that a lot of journalists were sick. Um, did you notice that too? And uh, did you happen to see any of the like clinics that they had set up or how did that work for international media that were there? It was kind of interesting, right? Like there was all this stuff on um, online about you needed insurance when you were there because it's state uh, sponsored insurance. And that way you don't get charged a million dollars or whatever if you land. And they just have, I think it was like 15 bucks or something. And they told us to get it at the airport, but I honestly spaced after my flight and I don't recall ever needing or getting it myself. Mm -hmm. um, having been sick in a foreign country, like real sick in Beijing in 2008, um, I got bronchitis of, of all things mm -hmm. and you know was laid up for a while. Um, you know, in hindsight, I wish I'd gotten it, but I didn't notice a lot of guys that were sick, but that's more probably due to assignment. I was more right. covering the country and a lot of the journalists had stayed in our apartments. Like I roomed with Brian Strauss. I don't recall him getting sick, but he, you know, they were all on the same bus a lot. Now Grant wasn't staying with us at the apartments. He had a, his own house with three other writers, if I recall correctly from mm -hmm. his postings. But um, yeah, I, I didn't notice it, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, when, Every time I go to the Olympics, I come back with some sort of terrible thing because yeah. you're just on a bus with people from all over the world and your body, you know, it's not ready for what's coming. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in reading your uh, Facebook posts throughout your time there, which I thought were terrific, um, you were pretty upfront about admitting that when you first got there, you literally said you, the place terrified you, you know, um, and that some of it had to do with uh, you know, what you'd heard about the Middle East or even thinking back to 9-11, but then over the course of your time there, you really came to um, 
love the place. I don't think it's too strong of a word, and yeah. especially a lot of the people you met from around the world that are living there now. Um, what what did it feel like when you first landed and why, why were you terrified? And then I want to get to the parts about it that you love. Yeah, you know, I, I think part of it is just newness and difference and, you know, very distinct setting where there's a lot of history between my country and theirs. Um, I wanted to be honest when I wrote about it because I'm sure that uh, Islamic feel, people feel the same way when they land in New York City and the kind of reception that they get. I think some of that is baked into what we see on TV and in movies and everything else. So even though I told myself, like, you know, go in with an open mind, that's one thing. But then you're signing all these documents. Some of them are like, we're, we won't take any pictures of anything like other than at events. You can't talk to regular citizens. You know, it just it, it had a level like a little bit beyond. The other thing I should say, to be fair to Qatar, is uh you know, like this is just a rough time for journalists. I read a, a story this morning that 73 journalists had died or something like that in the last year uh, or been killed. And mm -hmm. it was up from 47, you know, a year ago. Uh, I think a lot of that here in the in the States has been inflamed by Trump and his cronies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just can't be too careful. And, and I also think like I have a five-year-old son and a one-year-old daughter and things that maybe I wouldn't have cared about when I was younger have to mean more to me now. So, you kind of go over there feeling like it's going to be different. That was what appealed to me, to be honest with you, in writing it. But as it got closer, you start to think, like, am I doing my family a disservice here? You know, was this a bad decision because I made it for myself? Am I going to enjoy this at all? And, you know, you get over there and it's hard to get around. and You got to get your credential and all the things that are disorienting about flying across the world anyway. And then you throw in, like, am I being tracked? Are they listening to my phone calls? Am I going to hurt somebody I'm writing about? Because mm -hmm. they're going to find out who it is. Um, you know, I think some of that is in, invented in your own brain. And our minds are a magical place. And I, it definitely felt to me like there was more of that than other places. And maybe I just didn't notice before. But, yeah, I mean, I, I got on that plane to come over. It was 15-hour flight-ish. And, you know close to had a panic attack uh, this was like this is probably a bad idea you know okay. like why are we doing this but then it changed yeah um and before we get to it it changed you did mention that you saw you mentioned earlier in the interview that what 90 percent of the people that live there are migrants uh, from somewhere else and that are immigrants from somewhere else and that um a caste system and you said you saw people treated terribly, you know, uh, by people, uh, I assume that were uh, Qataris, or at least in a, yeah. an upper caste. Um, what are some examples of that? Oh, man, just anything where there was a worker who was doing something deemed wrong by a national, you know, I think they call them Qatari nationals, we did not see them much at all. In fact, how it changes related to this. Uh, but yeah, we, it was just, it was the tenor of the interactions. Now, it's not like I've never seen a subordinate getting yelled at at a Starbucks in the States. I, I want to be clear here, it's, but it was, the tenor of it was just like, you'd be at security and somebody would make a mistake and the, just the lashing they got was insane. Or I, I always started walking a lot and I, I had never really got used to sleeping there. So if I woke up at three or four, I'd just take laps because it's actually a very safe country as long as you don't fall under the government's eye or like you can walk around the street at five in the morning and nobody's going to bother you. Like they mm -hmm. have a very low crime rate. If I recall correctly, it might be the lowest in the world. And, you know, I'd see people working at four in the morning, you know, like outside of stadiums. Uh, we had a grocery store that went up at our apartment complex that they like built while we were there. You know, I did a story on these uh, shipping containers and they said that they'd check into E and like building R would be up by the next day and then S and then T. And you just see the way that these guys were treated. I mean, four in the morning, no water, no breaks, you know, just like it, it I certainly wasn't going to complain about my job when I was out there, you know, I just mm -hmm. wanted to stay on my P's and Q's so I didn't, no, nothing would happen. And so, I probably, and I discuss this a lot because I ended up writing about, a lot about U.S. fans, which I normally wouldn't do, but because the setting was so unique, I needed to, to write about a female experience, or I wanted to write about a guy who smuggled an alcohol through a fake sunscreen bottle or whatever, and they they all, to a person, said they felt the same way, you know, that it was, it was almost like, uh, you know, like, 
the like we presented a palatable view of what it what they wanted it to look like but that you can't erase that one person can treat another person that way yeah yeah wow um but you met a lot of really sweet beautiful helpful kind people um tell us a few of those stories a few of those people yeah so um this is kind of interesting uh i'll give you the quickest way i can say it that there's only about 300,000 Qatari nationals that live in a country of about 3 million, three, you know, a little over. And, you know, as I said, we didn't see them a lot. They have gated communities or they're out in the desert or they're living in the high rises that we don't have access to. And my understanding is their lives are entirely subsidized by the government or mostly subsidized by the government. So that means education, that means, you know, cars, houses, what's in those cars and houses. A lot of the a lot of the wealth in Qatar is concentrated behind home walls, you know, like mm. I went to the Islamic Museum of Art one day and it was incredible, like, you know, but there was just it's just so much money. But you don't see that as much when you're like out in the streets. Mm -hmm. What you see are the people that have come and slotted into the system. Right. And what your job is, is dependent on where you're from. So with most of the workers, they're from Nepal or Bangladesh or you know, places where you, you don't have another option and you have to go, you know? And so, I don't know, I, I was feeling a little bit unmoored. And so I decided that despite high anxiety and I'm just in general an anxious person, I wouldn't pin that on a country, right. but uh, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> that I would try to like meet some people, you know, see if I could find some stuff organically. And I developed this really cool routine that I actually miss terribly now that I'm back. And I would wake up, I'd start outside. It was hot as hell. You can't wear shorts. Like, I, and then I would just start walking and I'd go around my compound, like up the street, past the mosque, turn left, go the other side, uh, bump into the security guards. They were Sudanese. Uh, we'd talk about the games the night before, generally fist bumping them. And then I'd like go right into the neighborhood. And we lived in a traditional Islamic quarter, which was, I thought, kind of cool, you know, definitely cut down on my booze intake. And, uh, yeah. you know, then I bang left and go to my coffee shop. And these people were awesome. In fact, I got a text from one of the guys today because I gave him a wild card boxing sweatshirt. He's a huge Pacquiao fan. And so <laughs> because I knew these people were from, um, you know, the Philippines, I just would show them pictures of myself interviewing Manny over the years and they'd give me all sorts of stuff. By yeah, the end of the cool. I would sit down at the coffee shop. The woman who worked in the morning would put down my V60 pour. She'd generally give me a piece of free cake that is amazing San Sebastian cake made by this guy from Morocco, a huge Morocco sports fan. And then like the guy would come in for the afternoon shift and he'd make me a Spanish latte, which they introduced me to. It just means really sweet, essentially. And you know, then I'd, I'd pop outside, I'd walk by the barber shop. they had a ton of barber shops because there's nothing to do at night, right? And uh, the guy up front always wore a Yankees hat and he started screaming, judge, to me like every day. And one day he pulled me inside, put me in the chair and trimmed my beard. I, I could use him right now, as you could see. And, uh, you know, just like, um, I, th I feel like there's connection there that I didn't expect, both for myself, but for everybody, because... There's a 10% group that most people don't interact with. And if they do interact with them, it's generally not a positive or pleasant experience. And, you know, they're taking the helicopters to the game. Like I saw a helipad landing thing outside of the stadium in Alcor, Alba. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whereas like everybody else just kind of there for one reason or another. For me, it was to write about the country for my friends at the coffee shop. It was to have a better life than in the countries that were there. And... I actually found the people there very welcoming and open. Uh, I had this cab driver, Pradeep, definitely made this massive imprint on my life. He mm -hmm. took me around the country on my fourth, third or fourth day there. Uh, we talked about our families and being gone. He has a daughter back home. I had two kids, obviously not exactly the same, but, you know, some echoes. And, you know, the last day I, like, insisted he take me to the airport. We stopped at a coffee and, you know, I mean, it just... Like, uh, I'll never forget that stuff. And it came for me at a time of, um, you know, I just got a lot going on in my life right now and I needed it. And I actually left Qatar in a way better place than I started there, which I never would have thought beforehand. And I think it was due to like, it is a unique setting, but I think sometimes the nuance and complexity of it is lost. 
-hmm. you know, like the, there are ways that make it really different and ways that I think personally, just my opinion, make it really bad. But um, to just paint it as an authoritarian dictatorship where people don't have rights and where there's not people you can find that are friendly and helpful and everything. Uh, I don't think it's very accurate. Now, none of that changes the, all the deaths or the migrant worker situation or the caste system or everything else. Like, it's all there. But that's part of what I think, like, I try to open that vein when I wrote. Like, it, it's just a, this, I've never been to a place like it. I've covered sports on six continents. And it's just had a little bit of everything. In some ways, it was so beautiful and poetic and all the marble and this huge city that came out of nowhere built in 10 years. And then, you see these people working at 4 a.m. You're like, oh, that's how, you know, and then you see mm -hmm. the stories and the deaths. And it it just felt like none of that stuff was ever far away from each other. You know, like I could have these moments that really I'll never forget. And then I can have these moments where it's like this is just flat out wrong. And, you know, I think that is sort of what separated the experience for me, the, the sort of duality and contrast uh, that are evident there, unlike any place I've ever mm -hmm. been personally. What a, a ideal place for a great storyteller <laughs> to be. It sounds like I think you said you wanted to go back, right? And even take your family there. I take my kid there for sure. He yeah. always says, Daddy, I want to go to the desert. I got to get on a camel, you know? So <laughs> I don't know if I'll be welcome back after this interview. Anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. A couple more questions and getting to soccer. Um, I, I'm 52. I grew up just a sort of like baseball, basketball, football guy. Um, been kind of getting into soccer now that Nashville has a professional team uh, and I work at Vanderbilt which has a great women's team um, but you wrote that you said you finally saw the beauty in the beautiful game uh, while you were over there so you, you kind of came into this unlike Grant soccer hasn't been your passion over the years but uh, how, how did being there and seeing these games change your uh, view or appreciation of the game? Yeah, I think I had the other attitude uh, mainly because I can't run so I never really played it that much no I'm just kidding uh, you know, Brian was another great example of how I connected in ways I didn't expect when I was out there. You know, he he sat next to me for the England because you're sort of randomly assigned seats. And it's even though we're co-workers, it's not often together. And who was this again? Just for uh, Brian, Brian Strauss. He's yep. our main soccer writer. Great, great writer. No soccer as well as anyone in the world. Played in college. Um Anyway, he he was explaining England to U.S. to me, and then I saw a lot of my like non soccer fan people like crushing the fact it was a tie, which is maybe something a less evolved version of myself would have done. But <laughs> when he explained why they did the strategy and why it bottled England up and why it you know essentially gave them a couple chances to win, I started seeing it in a different way. And I've only covered one of the World Cup. It was in Brazil, and I barely went to any games. I went to way more this time because we had a smaller contingent, you know, and in Brazil, it was Brian and Grant together. And then I was off in the country doing other stuff, you know, and here it was just me and Brian. He did U.S. and I did, you know, the rest of the world and, you know, all the thing. Although we had Jonathan Wilson wrote some uh, freelance pieces, also a really good writer. And, you know, I just um, I try to watch the games more, I try to stay off Twitter. I close my laptop. I, maybe it was all part of this, like, you know, self journey I had when I was out there, but I just wanted to immerse, you know, I think a lot of times you write a story, especially when you get up there 20 years, like I've been doing it, like, you know, if I get these three people, I can write, you know, so you get those three people and you write it. And I think what I left out of my life was a little bit of room for serendipity. You know, you have kids, I would do a lot of work for Showtime on TV scripts, I go write books, I got a couple of docs in the works. And like my day is scheduled from 5am usually till 1.30. And, you know, I think what I allowed for when I was out there was like real moments of spontaneity, like being able to just be somewhere and not think about what I have to do. And that's when I say it changed my life. That's kind of how, you know, yeah. that it, yeah, I can wrap it all back in a bow too. like seeing Grant's death reminded me that I got to slow down myself, you know, yeah. but being in Qatar, and really like allowing for moments to happen that I otherwise would be closed off from because I'd be sitting right here, you know, writing something. Between those two things, I, you know, I think the best thing I can do for Grant at this point is to, to you know, really carry his spirit, you know, and that was helping people, that was mentoring people, and that was 
caring about what I write, but not planning it out so much in advance, you know, like really trying to allow for the news and the happenings and everything that he covered so incredibly well to, you know, be a guiding force for like when to move and how to move, but, you know, allowing for it to happen first. And I don't know, I feel like I've already started to employ that. And definitely that's a goal as we go forward. Mm -hmm. That's a a great lesson for, for everybody. Um, so last question, I mean, as we're sitting here, we don't know what the cause of death was. And it seems like we're left with these two possibilities. One, that it was a, a, a tragic but almost poetic death that he died at the World Cup covering soccer, something that he loved so much. Um, or he was potentially murdered for telling the truth about that same sport you know um how are you dealing with those two disparate possibilities at this moment yeah i think what i did after a couple of days is just try not to reconcile at all to me they're irreconcilable you know um in some ways if i'm looking for something that connects them they're both the job to me you know the job is like if i'm not going to write honestly about what i'm writing about then i don't need to write at all what's the point you know you can you can make money not working these hours without you know taking the risks and the I mean I just had a story with the high school football coach that landed in the Supreme Court I got 150 death threats off that story there's no story in the world that's worth that kind of consternation you know and it's just telling the truth is part of the job and working hard is part of the job and if you want to separate the way that Grant separated then you have to be Grant Wall which is really hard you know, um, almost impossible. And I think that what it taught me personally is that I need to slow down and, and do the things I talk about doing, you know, <laughs> like I need to be more present at home. I need to be, you know, more mindful of the risks. And I think you can still carry Grant's spirit into the world without working 90 hours a week, you know, and we're trapped in this sort of cycle where news newspapers and magazines and everybody's losing money. And yet there's a new kinds of social media every week. And, you know, while I'm out there, I'm doing videos on my phone. Some of them are standups. I'm sending video for my stories. I'm sending, I had probably 50 photo credits out there and I'm sending pictures and I'm working on an NFL story that I got to finish after we get off this call. And I'm, you know, trying to call home and I trying to meditate and trying to work out and like, it's just a lot. And I think sometimes we feel like we're going to lose our jobs if we don't, you know, if we're not doing every single thing we're asked to do. And, you know, either way, this this affirms something for me, you know, if, if Grant, if the worst case scenario is true, then it, um, then telling the truth becomes more important for me than ever, because that's how to honor him, you know, to do it right the way that he did. And if it's what seems more likely that he had a heart attack and worked too hard, then it affirms for me what I've already been thinking that I need to slow down. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think something like this is so tragic that like the, the first most important thing always and forever is going to be Grant and his family and their loss. But I think it also, it, it it's helpful, I think, in some ways, if we could all learn from him, because the lesson could be as simple as just be kind. Grant was kind as hell. He was one of the kindest people I knew. And he was a steeled kind of kind, which I think is sort of a rare combination. And it was that sort of, you know, duality to him. Like he, he loved soccer. He went after every story and he helped everybody who he encountered. If we had more people like that, you know, the world would be a totally different place. So yeah, I, I guess that's a long way of saying, like, I'm not quite sure how I feel right now, but I'm yeah. determined to carry Grant forward however I can. Okay. Well, man, thank you so much uh, for all of this, for, you know, sharing so much about uh, an amazing person gone too soon and also giving us some insight into what it was like really to be there uh, to cover the World Cup. It sounds like you've got an article to get back to. So um, Thanks for your time and everybody, you know, check out Greg Bishop's work uh, at Sports Illustrated. And thanks again for joining us. Take care.